Hi everyone, thanks so much for waiting. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Emma Bernstein and I'm one of the Florida House's interns this summer. We have another intern joining us today, Raghav Rinchia, and we are pleased to welcome you to the sixth and final seminar of the Meet and Inventors series. Here at Florida House, the only state with an embassy in DC, we work to connect, celebrate, and champion Florida to the world. We operate as a nonprofit organization providing educational, cultural, economic, and social resources to connect Floridians with Washington, D.C. In doing so, we are proud to host the Meet and Inventors series in partners with the Cage Museum of Creativity and Invention, as well as the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame to bring Florida inventors into the spotlight. Today, we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Yogi Goswami. Dr. Yogi Goswami is a distinguished university professor and director of the Clean Energy Research Center at the University of South Florida. He is also a co-founder and chief science and technology advisor of the Molecule Incorporation. He has published as an author or editor two, uh, 22 books and more than 400 scientific papers. He is the emeritus editor-in-chief of the preeminent scientific journal, Solar Energy. He also holds 31 patents and has been inducted in the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Dr. Goswami is the recipient of the highest energy-related awards of ASME, ASES, ISES, and AAES, and more than 50 other awards and certificates from major engineering and scientific societies. Professor Goswami has served as the president of the International Solar Energy Society, a governor and senior vice president of the ASME International, and president of the International Association for Solar Energy Education. We are so honored to have Dr. Goswami with us today. Before we start the conversation, I would like to recognize Jamie Spurrier, the program manager from the Florida Inventor Hall of Fame. Jamie, if you would like to say words about the Hall of Fame, that would be great. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to first thank Florida House and the Cave Museum for Creativity and Invention for this wonderful opportunity in our last meeting together. We couldn't be more excited about our speaker today, Florida Inventors Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Yogi Goswami. So good to see you again, Dr. Goswami. And what a perfect collaboration and celebration of innovation for the state of Florida. And that really is what the heart of the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame is, to celebrate the innovation in, in Florida and also to serve as a hub for the innovation ecosystem here. Florida is a powerhouse of innovation in the United States. We bring together top tier research university and in, universities and institutions, NASA Kennedy Space Center and a prolific entrepreneur network as well as disruptive collaborations between industry, academia, and government. As a result, Florida consistently ranks in the top 10 states for most patents produced and the top three states for most trademarks registered. At the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame, we are a statewide initiative dedicated to recognizing and celebrating Florida's vibrant innovation ecosystem and the remarkable inventors from our state, all of whom have advanced the quality for life of Americans. It is our mission to encourage individuals of all ages and backgrounds to strive toward the betterment of society through continuous groundbreaking innovation. We are driven to support a culture of creativity, one that fuels innovation, drives economic growth, and encourages investment in Florida. The Florida Inventors Hall of Fame is located at the University of South, Ta South Florida Tampa campus, and our museum exhibits inventions and innovations from our inductees, including one of Dr. Goswami's original molecule units. Um, to date, we have inducted 58 remarkable inventors. They collectively hold over 4,000 patents. Each year, we hold an annual ceremony in Tampa where we celebrate and recognize the year's inductees. And we invite you to come and visit, visit us anytime or join us at the ceremony in Tampa on November 5th, 2021. Thank you again, Emma, back to you. Thanks, Jamie. At Florida House, we have the pleasure of hosting Cage Museum's 
in a state of innovation, an exhibition about our state's incredible and widespread uh, contribution to innovation. This exhibit even highlights some of the speakers you will hear from in the series. This exhibition in the series itself would not have been possible without the guidance from the Cape Museum of Creativity and Invention. I would like to welcome Ellie Tom, Director of Product Development from the Cape Museum to say a few words about this project. Thank you for the introduction, Emma. I'm delighted to be here today speaking on behalf of the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention. The Cade Museum's mission is to transform communities through inspiring and equipping future inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries. We are excited to have our In a State of Innovation exhibit on display at Florida House right now, and to be partnering with Florida House and the Inventors Hall of Fame on this speaker series. The Cade Museum was named for Dr. James Robert Cade, the lead inventor of Gatorade. Dr. Cade was a scientist, doctor, musician, poet, and an inventor. The story of the invention of Gatorade and Dr. Cade's inventive mindset is at the heart of everything we do at the museum. Through our programs, exhibits, and events, we aim to spark wonder in the next generation and to equip them with the tools they need to solve tomorrow's problems and to one day change the world. If you ever visit the Cade, prepare to roll up your sleeves, ask big questions, and be an inventor. All of our programming and exhibits are hands-on and facilitated by a knowledgeable and energetic education team. If Gainesville, Florida is a little too far away, you can always engage with us virtually by listening to our podcast, Radio Cade. Radio Cade provides a glimpse into the brilliant minds and hearts of world-class inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries, such as Dr. Goswami. The Cade Museum also plays an important part in Florida's innovation ecosystem. Since 2010, the Cade Prize has celebrated innovation by identifying, recognizing, and celebrating Florida-based inventors and entrepreneurs who demonstrate a creative approach to addressing problems in their field of expertise. As one of the largest cash prize competitions for innovation in Florida, the Cade Prize has drawn hundreds of creative thinkers from diverse sectors who enter cutting edge inventions with real market potential. In 2021, the Cade Prize will award $50,000 in seed capital prizes. We're actually accepting applications right now for the Cade Prize. You can find more information on our website. Now to begin the conversation, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Richard Miles. Richard Miles co-founded the Cade Museum and served as a vice president on the board of directors. Mr. Miles has had a long distinguished career in foreign service around the world. Mr. Miles received a BA in Russian studies from the University of Washington in 1987 and an MS in foreign service from Georgetown University in 1993. He currently serves as chairman of the Trinity Forum and as a board member of the Prison Fellowship International. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today and we'll pass the mic over to Richard now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie and, um, and Emma for, to Florida House for putting this together and of course the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, Dr. Goswami, welcome. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to interview you. And as we were talking about earlier, I, I was actually there when you were inducted into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame in 2016. And uh, one of hundreds of people who congratulated you after the event. So I'm sure you don't have any memory of that, but I think you have a great story and I think people are gonna really uh, like hearing about it this afternoon. So why don't we start by talking about, um, you know, your most of your contributions are in the field of solar energy, which is great for the Sunshine State. And, and that's an area in which we have seen tremendous development over the last several years or last several decades, going back at least uh, 50 years or more. Um, so why don't we start, what originally got you interested in the field of solar, solar energy? Well, let me first of all say it's my pleasure to be on this program. And uh, yes, to talk about solar energy, uh, there's a history to it. And I need to explain that. Back around 1973, 1974, uh, there was an Arab oil embargo. So what it was, uh, right after the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, the oil producing countries decided to not sell oil to USA and to some of the Western countries. So I was a graduate student at that time. 
uh, working on my PhD. And I saw uh, lines at the gas stations that went miles long. And some cars would run out of gas before they got to the gas pump. So at that time, I started thinking as to what is our future? Is, is this what we have to live with in the future? Uh, is this the energy source that we have to depend on uh, where you know, somebody decides to not sell it to you and then, then you don't know what to do? So the more I thought about it, the more I felt that it wasn't just for US, it was for the whole world, that we can't forever depend on an energy source that is limited, uh, which, is, uh, which comes from the ground. So we got to look at a source which is unlimited and it uh, comes from outside this earth. And the only source uh, I could think of was the sunlight. And so I felt that that is what we will have to depend on in the future. So even, even though for my PhD, I could not change my topic, but right after my PhD, I said, I'm going to dedicate my life to developing uh, solar energy applications uh, because that is what we will have to depend on in the future. So that started my journey uh, at that time. And I remember this. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to comment. I remember those days, of the mid '70s, of the oil embargoes and the long lines of the gas stations. And uh, yeah, I was just a kid, but it, it seemed that there's no way out of that. We'd always be dependent on on oil from other places. And so I'm really glad that smart people like you started thinking about how to get out of that box. Right. At, the, at that time, nobody really, really gave, gave it a chance. They felt, oh, you know, solar energy maybe will be able to uh, get one, two percent, three percent, maybe less than five percent of our energy needs for the future. Uh, but uh, there were some others uh, like me who uh, started to think about it and said, no, we, we will be able to get majority of our energy from sunlight. Uh, we just have to develop the science and the technology. And so that's why I started working in that field. So let's drill down a little bit on that science and technology. And last time I checked, Dr. Goswami, you have at least 19 patents. You've probably got more in the works. But why don't, in, in simple terms, uh, what have your inventions in the field of solar technology enabled us to do that we couldn't do before or enabled you know, people who manufacture or at least um, source solar power, what can they do as a result of your in inventions that uh, people didn't know how to do before? Well, as you can imagine that uh, anybody who's worked in a field for about 50 years, uh, I've worked in many areas of solar energy. Uh, started with looking at the solar resource as to how much resource we have, uh, modeling of that, measuring of that, then uh, looking at how we can use it for heating and cooling, because that sort of comes naturally because sunlight uh, can be absorbed, becomes heat. Uh, then going into production of electrical power from it. So anyway, uh, I kept working on various fields, but the one where I feel uh, I brought something new to the picture, was utilizing sunlight for environmental applications, uh, most prominently cleaning contaminated water. So, because everything else that we were thinking about was using it as energy for energy applications. But we developed a technology, and this is when I was at the University of Florida uh, in Gainesville, uh, that uh, uh, we could use sunlight to clean contaminated groundwater. And it turned out that at that time, uh, groundwater uh, all over the country uh, had problems because the, uh, uh, for uh, gas pumps, uh, gas stations, we had these uh, tanks buried underground. And those tanks over time started to leak. And so the gasoline, which was uh, very toxic chemicals, they got into our groundwater. 
And so that means we could not drink that groundwater until we clean it up. And so, so we developed a technology called solar photocatalytic oxidation technology that uh, you could use with the sunlight to clean contaminated groundwater. And we first demonstrated uh, at a larger scale at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base, which is near Panama City uh, in Florida. And so at that uh, Air Force Base, we would pump groundwater, which was contaminated with jet fuel and lubricants, and with the help of sunlight, uh, completely clean it up. Uh, then later on, uh, uh, I have other inventions. For example, sunlight is intermittent. You know, you have it available during daytime, but not nighttime. And even during daytime, uh, not during cloudy periods. So energy storage, that is storing uh, energy when it's available and then using it when it's not available. Uh, is a very important part of it. So, so people know about battery storage, for example. Uh, another form is thermal storage. That is converting sunlight to heat at high temperatures and storing that heat. So, so that's another area where uh, I have a few inventions and their importance is now becoming clearer to a lot of people around the world now. Uh, so so that, that was the other thing. Then uh, I have another uh, invention called the Goswami cycle. You know, people gave it the name Goswami cycle. Uh, I simply call it a cycle, a thermodynamic cycle that produces power and cooling in the same cycle. So, so, so far we had where you could produce power. And so in this case, we could produce power and cooling simultaneously. And that has now been extended to not just power and cooling, but also desalination. That is uh, 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 getting clean drinking water out of seawater. So because water uh, is expected to be the biggest problem in the world, in the future. So anyway, so these are some of my uh, innovations in the field of solar energy, and we continue to work in it. Those are, those are great stories. And, and one thing we, we talk about a lot at the Cade Museum is that inventors often see connections that, that normal people don't see. So you, in the first instance, you saw a, another use for solar uh, power besides just solar power. And then um, I, I've heard you talk about another connection you made that is really kind of the, the basis of, of molecule, and that is you realize there's a connection between clean groundwater, as you as you said, with solar technology, and also being able to purify air with uh, light waves and solar technology. So why don't if you could explain a little bit about how that works, but also how did that insight come to you? You know, because for for some inventors, it sort of comes in a flash. In others, it's a gradual process. So do you remember you know, where you were, what you were thinking when you all of a sudden thought, hey, we can actually use the same thing that we're using to clean groundwater to actually purify air? Yeah, well, you know, for any inventor, you don't just say, oh, I'm going to invent something <laughs> and then start thinking of that invention. So there has to be some kind of need that you feel that it's an intense need and, and nobody else has found the solution. And then you start to think about it. Uh, so in the first case, in the case of solar energy, I saw this societal need where, you know, we saw long line, gas lines and so on. But in this case, it was a very personal need. Uh, my son uh, is asthmatic from birth and has a lot of allergies. And I grew up in India, maybe exposed to everything a person could have been exposed to. So uh, uh, I did not have any allergies. I did not even know what asthma feels like. And so uh, while he was a kid, we had to, my wife and I had to take him to emergency almost once a month uh, because uh, uh, he could not breathe. 
Uh, so over time, we learned to manage his allergies or asthma triggers from food. For example, nuts, peanuts, and, and, and those kinds of things. So we did all of that. And then I felt that there were still some triggers for his asthma. And, and they were most probably coming from air. So it was not like I was going to invent something for him. I was just looking for an air purifier. <laughs> and so we got a few from the market, but none of them really worked for him. And so then I uh, saw that there was a conference where experts on air purification technologies were going to speak. So I went to that conference. I sat in the audience uh, trying to learn from them. And the more they talk, the more I got the feeling that these people don't even understand the problem. How can they give us the solution? Because all they were talking about filtration of air, which we have had you know, since the 1930s and 40s. So on my way back uh, from there, while I was in the plane, I started to think about the solar technology that I had just demonstrated at Tyndall Air Force Base and CNN headline news and everybody covered that. So I said, I could probably use that same technology for air because it uh, requires a source of light. I won't use sunlight, but I will use lamps of the same wavelength. And it requires some water molecules and air uh, has humidity in it. We can't even get rid of it. And so, so maybe this would work. And so I drew up my plans for how I was going to do it on my flight back from Chicago to uh, Tampa. And so, so I and and we started doing the experiments, and we we found that technology uh, that it would work. Uh, and then we made a, a prototype in the lab. And that prototype went into my son's bedroom. And about uh, two or three, week, three weeks after that, I overheard him telling uh, my wife, his mom, he says, mom, I've not been using my inhaler that much. And so I felt, oh my, this technology is working. And, and so, so that's how that invention came about. And uh, it still needed a lot more research uh, to perfect it, to get it to a point where it could help a lot of other people. But eventually, uh, he's the one who said, you know, it's helping you so much. Uh, I hope we can bring it to the rest of the people so that it helps others also. So, so that was the beginning of molecules. So Dr. Goswami, I got to say, you know, most of us on a plane ride either take a nap or, you know, play a video game or watch a movie and, and you come up with a new invention. So I, and, you know, next time I'm, I'm booking flight with you to, to, uh, to get more creative. Um, let's, let's talk about a Molecule, which is now the commercialized uh, version of that invention of, of being able to uh, air purifier, uh, which was listed by Time Magazine as one of the, the 25 best inventions in 2017. And um, as you know, or you've discovered, uh, being an entrepreneur is not the same as being a research scientist. And uh, trying to do both at the same time is, is hard. So why don't you tell us uh, how, how have you managed to balance the two roles in, in terms of uh, the obvious research that you already talked about that goes into a product like that and continues to develop it. And then also, you know, finding investors and uh, basically, uh, finding a demand or at least uh, customers for it. What has that been like for you? It's, it's actually very challenging. Uh, sometimes I think of being a scientist is much easier <laughs> than being an entrepreneur uh, because uh, entrepreneurship involves so much more than just having an invention. And uh, so, for example, we had the, uh, the technology we built a few units in the lab. They were prototypes. And being an engineer, you know, I designed them 
like an engineer would like, but uh, they may not be what ordinary people want to see. And so, so you have to then bring uh, teams together, uh, people with different way of looking at things, people with different expertise, and, and you have to uh, then say, okay, uh, I'm a scientist, but I don't know everything. <laughs> there are other people who know a lot more about things that are needed to take this into a successful product. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, that uh, engineering type of design, uh, if we wanted to sell it in the open market, uh, yes, some people who really need it, they will buy it. But most people say, well, no, it doesn't look good. So, so as we formed a company, which was really a family company, myself, my wife, and my son, uh, who wanted to bring it to the rest of the people, and he convinced his sister to join us also. Uh, and then we started to bring the team together. And the first person we hired was a person who had shown uh, his talent for design. So, so the first thing he did was, okay, we're going to take this engineering uh, uh, prototype and put it into a device that uh, not only works, but also looks good. So that, uh, you know, you may have noticed that uh, ordinary air purifiers that are on the market, people buy them, they push them in a corner. Uh, they don't want anybody to see their air purifier. <laughs> And when it's in the corner, it's not really cleaning your air. And we wanted to have a design that you would be proud to put it in the middle of your room or somewhere where everybody can see so that it's actually cleaning all of the air of the room. So that's why the Museum of Modern Art in New York, they actually put that unit in their window uh, because they saw it as work of art. And uh, so, so not only that, then you need to bring other people in, you know, people who are good in marketing, people good, on, good in sales, uh, and continue to do R&D. So in other words, you have to build a whole team. Uh, now, to do all of that, you have to have capital. Uh, and a and lot of great ideas never really see the light of the day because uh, they are not able to uh, attract investment. So, so in this case, uh, again, uh, in the Silicon Valley in California, where we felt, okay, that's where there are lots of uh, uh, people who are innovators themselves who, and who uh, have good amount of money that they would like to invest. But they were all investing in um, the software type of technologies. And so the first big investor uh, we were able to contact uh, said, look, you know, I don't uh, invest in hardware type of technologies. Uh, so I won't invest, but you are welcome to uh, pitch to me. In other words, give me a presentation. And he said, oh, but I won't invest, but I think my wife and son could use a device like that. And so we said, okay, we took one of those uh, lab made units over there. And we uh, said after the presentation, well, you know, just take it home, hope it helps your son and your wife. And, and so a week later, he called. And he said, I want to invest in this because it helped his son and his wife so much that he felt that uh, uh, this is something that will help uh, other people also. So, so then for after that, it was uh, word of mouth. And also uh, we did a beta study throughout the country where we gave these units to about 50 people around the country who uh, volunteered online and all of them had some problems. And so, so they uh, used these units, 
they gave their uh, feedback and based on uh, those surveys we found out that uh, in two weeks use that uh, allergy and asthma sufferers uh, that their symptoms reduced to non sufferers just in two weeks and, and after four weeks that they were sustained uh, uh, improvement in their uh, symptoms. And so those things, we did some medical studies. So all of those helped to, uh, to bring this uh, molecule to the uh, rest of the people. And then uh, uh, it just turned out that uh, we were already discussing with FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, you don't normally find air purifiers being uh, uh, certified or cleared by FDA. Uh, but because our technology destroys uh, viruses and bacteria and spores and volatile organic chemicals in air, so FDA uh, people were uh, open and willing to look at these units and uh, they cleared uh, these units for uh, reducing the risk against uh, uh, viruses, uh, uh, especially COVID. And so uh, I'm very happy to tell you that it helped a lot of medical personnel uh, last year and then other people also. Well, Dr. Koswami, you clearly got some very good advice because at, at the museum we encounter, uh, often, not often, but occasionally, um, research scientists who are used to being the smartest person in the room, and they think, well, how hard can it be to you know, develop a product and take it to market? It turns out it's pretty hard. So I, I think your recognition that you needed a team, you needed other skill sets to, to help you do this was a, sort of pivotal to, to your success. Uh, one thing I, I heard you say um, is, is that you, you described yourself as a kid who liked to take things apart and put them back together again, sometimes not always in the original configuration. And, and one thing we're always interested in is sort of what, are, what were the experiences or the role models that you had as a child that you think or you feel led you to a career of research uh, and invention? Was it your parents or teachers? Or describe for us a little bit about what your early life was like and how you think that helped uh, you know, make you the, the research scientists that you are today. Uh, well, uh, a big part of that is the curiosity. Um, I was growing up in India and we didn't have access to a lot of devices over there. Uh, but uh, I was always curious uh, whenever there was some kind of mechanical or electrical device to see how it works uh, inside. And I remember that when I was maybe fifth or sixth grade uh, that my older brother, uh, he brought a tool set for me. And, uh, you know, tool set including screwdrivers and, and wrenches and stuff. So, so I saw a clock in the house and I decided to use those tools, opened it up uh, to see how it's working inside. And, and in that case, uh, while I was doing all of that and putting it back together, I broke the glass <laughs> of that, but I was able to put it back together. Uh, so, so I started to do those kinds of things, which made me some, gave me some understanding of how these things work. As far as mentorship, uh, I would say my older brothers, uh, without their knowledge, they uh, became my mentors uh, because they were uh, going to study engineering. Uh, in fact, they're both uh, engineers and and one of them retired as distinguished professor at Clemson University, uh, and the other retired as a uh, uh, very senior engineer in uh, a company in New Jersey. So, so I I would uh, try to follow them, and, and and so that that without their knowledge were my mentors, which helped me to develop that interest. To, and the, and to satisfy my curiosity of knowing things. That's a great story. 
Uh, all right, we're now at, at um, probably one of the most interesting points of all of our interviews, and that's the question and answer uh, period. So I'm going to just basically, I think all of you know that if you have a question, just type it in the, the chat box and I will uh, go ahead and read it out. So we have a uh, question here. Uh, where do you see the future of solar energy technology? Okay, so solar energy, I mean, we get it as radiation, but you can convert that radiation into many different forms of energy. So, uh, you know, the easiest you see is, okay, as you absorb on a surface, it becomes hot. So certainly you can use it to uh, develop heat, you know, whether it's hot water, whether it's heating a building and cooling is just the reverse of heating. So you can use it for that application also. Then in 1954 at Bell Labs, scientists who were working, they developed that photovoltaic device which converted sunlight directly to electricity. Uh, so we can, uh, use it for those applications. Then I showed, for example, that we could use it for environmental applications. So the point is that you can pretty much use solar energy for any application you like. The only problem is with sunlight, and that's the same with wind also, and wind is an indirect form of sunlight because it's the solar energy which is then being converted to uh, the motion of the way, uh, of the air, which becomes the wind technology. So the only form uh, problem is that sunlight is available not 24 hours a day, uh, only during daytime, not nighttime, and e even during daytime when it's actually sunny, not cloudy. <clears throat> so energy storage is extremely important. That means development of various ways to store that energy. I mentioned our uh, innovations in thermal energy storage, that is storing it as heat. Uh, battery energy storage is another uh, uh, way of doing it. And then there are some other ways also. So in all of these areas, we still need to uh, reduce the cost of these energy storage. But uh, there's a lot of work going on around the world. So I see a future that uh, maybe by 2050, more than 50% of our total energy in the world will actually be coming from solar uh, energy, whether it's direct solar energy or indirect solar energy. In other words, indirect would be uh, wind or uh, biomass, biofuels, and so on. <clears throat> and as we go into the future after that, more and more of our energy uh, will be coming from solar energy. So the only question is, uh, can it uh, give us all of the energy that we need? Uh, because in future sometime, whether it's 100 years from now or 200 years from now, uh, the energy that we have in the ground uh, will probably be gone. We'll have it used up. And, and the, the good news is, yes. Uh, I, uh, when I teach solar energy course uh, to students at USF, uh, in the first class, I ask them to uh, just give me uh, an answer by whatever way they are thinking. And that is, uh, if we were to use sunlight to produce all of the electrical power of US that we need here, 24 hours a day, how much land area we would need? And, and, and some people say, some students write, well, you know, we'll probably need to cover the whole country with solar panels. Some say, well, this, area of the whole country is not enough. But then when we start to do just uh, calculations, we find out that a total area of 100 miles by 100 miles 
is enough to provide all of the power for us 24 hours a day and, and so so that means uh, of course we won't do it all at one place uh, uh, even though we can find in the some desert areas you can drive 100 miles and you don't see another person there uh, but you won't do that but you can do it at many places uh, the the uh, main point is that if needed we can produce all of our energy from solar. Uh, whether we first convert it to electricity and then electricity to other forms of energy, or we directly convert sunlight to the form of energy that we need. Got a lot of questions coming in here. I won't be able to get to all of them, but let me let me skip ahead to one from I'm Jamie Spurrier from Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, how has your molecule technology been useful during the pandemic? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, FDA, uh, based on tests, uh, cleared it to reduce the risk from COVID. And the tests that were done were with not COVID, but a surrogate of COVID, which is... Uh, MS2 uh, uh, virus. Uh, and, and the idea is that if it can destroy that virus, it can destroy COVID also. And the test showed that in a single pass through the air purifier, you can destroy 99.99% of the viruses. So with that as the result, uh, I remember that last year, in March and April, uh, we as a company decided that uh, we wanted to help uh, wherever we could. And we felt that the medical personnel, the doctors and the nurses and other medical personnel, that they were risking their lives to save other lives. So, so we did, decided to donate units to uh, hospitals uh, and most prominently, they went to hospitals in Gainesville and in Tampa uh, area, but then into other areas also, and then to daycare centers and, and those places. So, uh, but uh, we, even though as a company, you know, we got a lot of sales, uh, which is great for a company, but uh, my happiness uh, comes from the fact that a lot of people felt that this technology and these systems, they help them. And, and that is always uh, what makes me happy when I hear from people. And a lot of people somehow find out my email address or my contact information, and they like to write to me as to how, uh, how thankful they are because this technology has helped them personally or their children or their families. Uh, changing gears just a little bit, going back to sort of the underlying technology of, of solar power. Uh, we have a question here related to so solar panels. It says commercial solar panels usually have an average efficiency of 18 to 20%. Do you think significant advances to increase efficiency are possible? Um, uh, short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and that's why we continue to do research and we need to keep doing research. Um, so when the solar panels were first developed, uh, we could only uh, uh, get an efficiency of 5%. And I'm glad that we kept doing research and now we are at commercial panels, which uh, uh, can from one company can get efficiency of 22%. Uh, but in research, uh, there are panels uh, that you can actually find from the website of National Renewable Energy Lab because they publish data on the what they call the champion efficiency. That is, uh, whichever company or uh, uh, research lab has produced the highest efficiency panels, they uh, note that in that website. And there they have shown that uh, you can achieve an efficiency of 45%. Uh, 
Now, it's not like 45% is our limit, but we need to keep working on it and keep improving the efficiency. But we don't have to wait for the efficiency to go up. We can use whatever efficiency we have today because uh, in the end, we have to see, okay, when we're using these panels, even at lower efficiency, we are helping uh, in reducing that risk of climate change because uh, what we would use in place of it, the fossil fuels, that they are not helping us uh, because uh, they produce uh, greenhouse gases, which then give us climate change. So next question is from my uh, co-founder at the Cade Museum, Phoebe Miles, wanted to know if when you were little, did you get in trouble for taking apart household appliances or did your parents recognize you as a genius? I suppose the answer could be both to yes, but what, what reaction did you get from your parents? Yes, the answer is both. Uh, and I did get into trouble. I mentioned this clock that, you know, was uh, very precious to us <laughs> and I, broke the glass piece of it. <laughs> uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, as I mentioned that my brothers who uh, were becoming engineers, uh, they're much older than me, uh, that they uh, were able to explain to the rest of the family that, hey, let him do what he wants to do. Uh, and this just shows his curiosity and, and let's not stop him from doing these things. So that's the opposite instinct of most older brothers. Most older brothers would have made sure you got in trouble for taking things apart. <laughs> right, because these these brothers were much older. My uh, older brother is 10 years older than me and the, I see. the oldest is uh, uh, 12 years older than me. And, and they they were always worried uh, that I, I was, uh, uh, I was of course a good student. And so I remember one time that I wanted a book so my father gave my brother the money to buy me that book. And my brother came back with a hockey stick. He said, you have enough books and you read enough. <laughs> you need to do other things. <laughs> so uh, so they, they were always, uh, uh, you know, very uh, loving and, and helpful to me. Well, that, that's great and uh, unusual to have older brothers looking out for you like that. Uh, I'm sure you really appreciated it. Uh, I think we have time for one last question before I turn it back over to Emma. Uh, we have a question here dealing with UV air filters. A lot of UV air filters are being introduced in the market. Are there any significant benefits for using UV in terms of killing pathogens? Okay, so I have to explain one thing. that. Uh, uh, in the market, when they say UV air filters, they mostly use UVC, which is very high energy UV. And that's the kind of UV that you cannot be exposed to. Because if your skin is exposed to it, you will get cancer. Not only that, it's such high energy that it actually uh, converts oxygen to ozone. And you don't want to be breathing ozone also. So I would advise people to not go for any of those UV air filters. Uh, our technology also uses a UV, but it's called UVA, which is uh, what we are exposed to in the sunlight. So when we go out in the sunlight, uh, we do have visible light, but there is one uh, which is very close to visible light, but it's UV. It's called UVA. And so uh, in this technology, that UVA simply excites a, a catalyst. A and that catalyst then does the rest of the work. That is, as the uh, uh, pollutants, which are the uh, microorganisms, the viruses, bacteria, spores, or volatile organic chemicals that we have a lot indoors from our paints and carpets and, and other surface finishes, that it just oxidizes them and that means destroys those uh, uh, pollutants. So, so that part is okay. And in my case, when I was developing this technology, 
uh, I felt that I wanted to do something that would take care of a problem for the people, not introduce additional problem. Okay. So, so, so you need to be careful of what device you are getting and what kind of UV it is using. So the one that we use in Molecule, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of uh, at the junction of UV and visible. And that you can be exposed to. It doesn't uh, 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 cause you any harm. It doesn't produce any ozone. And uh, yet it does what it's supposed to do. Thank you. I feel much more educated about that now. Um, uh, Dr. Goswami, thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. I'm going to turn it over to Emma for final words, but I, re I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you did as well, and I hope our, our viewers did. It's my, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much to Dr. Goswami for participating today, and thank you, Richard, for being a mod creator. Dr. Goswami, your journey and story about what drove you to creating molecules is really interesting to me, and we're glad to have learned a little bit about your insight into solar energy. Thank you for everyone to be able to join today for our last Meet and Inventor conversation. It has been such a pleasure working with the Cade Museum and the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. And we are so glad to have had this wonderful experience meeting Florida Inventors. Thank you again to our partners and to Dr. Goswami. Stay in touch with all of us on social media. We hope you've had a great time this summer at Florida House on Capitol Hill, where you're always welcome. Thank you. <laughs>